So this exam that you're going to be having Thursday covers chapters 3, 4, and 5. Chapter 3 has a number of different things. The main focus in chapter 3, the thing that we spent the most time on was related rates, but uh, there's more to it than related rates. So when I say rates of change here, I'm not talking about related rates. I'm just talking about rates of change. I'm talking about the idea that when you take the derivative of y with respect to x, you're finding a relationship for a rate of change. So for example, um, for example, you know, there's that classic volume question. When you have a volume of water remaining in a tank in liters that's equal to this number, or this expression rather, I'll make it interesting. For some particular reason, that would be an expression that you could use to calculate the volume of water remaining in the tank. If I ask you, what is the rate of change of volume in the tank at, and I would have to give you a domain here, I would say that Uh, t can be any number between 1 and 16, and let's just say t is in minutes or seconds. It doesn't matter. That's not my intention here. We're not going to actually do this problem. If I say to you, what is the rate of change of volume in the tank at 3, I guess I will lock into the idea of minutes, then really you need to know that all I'm asking you to do, the only thing I'm asking you to do is find dv dt at t equals 3. That's it. You know, and, and, and that's really a carryover from the first unit, except that in the first unit we were using limits to calculate it. And you don't want to use limits here. Well, you can if you want to, but uh, a derivative is the way to go. Um, another quick example would be uh, I simply ask you to find, and again, this is a bit of a carryover from the first unit, um, I tell you a sphere is shrinking. I would probably put a little bit more effort into the context of that. Maybe it's a snowball that's melting. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then the question is find the rate of change of the surface area with respect to the radius when the radius is 4 centimeters. And you want to be very, very careful here to be able to understand the context of what we're talking about. Over here, since the function was a function of volume in terms of time, I didn't feel the need to tell you that you want to find out the rate of change of volume with respect to time. It's going to be liters per minute, and it would be a negative number because the derivative is going to end up being negative because of the chain rule. But in this particular example, which is still an illustration of rates of change, it's not with respect to time. What you're asked to find here very specifically is d surface area dr when r is equal to 4. And I don't honestly believe this is a difficult question. You go to your formula sheet or it would be given to you in the exam question and you see that the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared pretty sure that's right. And you just find DADR. So this is almost a test between the question about the volume and this, particularly if they're one after each other on the exam. It's really a test in particular of your ability to understand what with respect to means. Included in the idea, so going back to the general review here, in, included in one of the main ideas here in Chapter 3 of Rates of Change is a very specific set of rates of change, which is that the, re the rate of change of position with respect to time is velocity. The rate of change of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. 
So you are going to have to, because it's been a long time. It's been, I'm guessing, at least a month since we've started this unit, or very close. You're going to have to go back and review those types of problems. Okay. And then the big one in Chapter 3 is solving related rates problems, which is really different than just saying rates of change. This is what I mean by your ability to understand with respect to and what's going on. With a rate of change problem, what I'm calling rates of change in the first bullet up here, I'm just talking about finding an equation relating y and x and finding dy dx. y could be volume and x could be time. y could be area and x could be radius. But there's nothing tricky going on here. With related rates, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing it in detail because we would be here for an hour just on related rates. But with related rates, remember that you differentiate implicitly with respect to time. And when I say implicitly, what I'm telling you, what I'm implying, no pun intended, is that time is not a variable in the equation that you're working with. And, and again, this gets, this gets tricky to wrap your head around. Because I had this question here that I say a sphere is shrinking, find the rate of change of the surface area with respect to the radius when the radius is four centimeters, I can easily now change this question, and I can say a sphere is changing, is shrinking at oh, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to re really rewrite a lot of this. I can say a sphere is shrinking so that the area decreases at 10 square centimeters per minute. And all of a sudden, this is turning into a related rates problem and not just a rate of change problem. A sphere is shrinking so that the area decreases at 10 square centimeters per minute. Find the rate of change of the radius when r equals 4 centimeters. And again, there's some implication here that since I told you the rate of change of the area is square centimeters per minute, then I'm talking about with respect to time. So when I say what is the rate at which the radius is changing, I want to find out dr dt. So what this is saying is what is dr dt when r equals 4. And when you take a look at these two questions, th they're really kind of similar, except that in this one, you would simply say dA dr equals 8 pi r and you would be done. There's no dr dt here because you're differentiating with respect to r. Well, you're not done. You have to put the number 4. You have to put the number 4 in here, and then you'll have 32 pi, and the units would be square centimeters per centimeter because it's area with respect to radius. Whereas here, since it's a related rates problem, what you would do is you would differentiate everything with respect to time. And that's really different. I mean, look at the top of this screen and compare it to the top of this screen. They're just totally different ideas. 
So what you would do in the related rates problem is you would put the negative 10 in for dA dt because it says it's shrinking at that rate. You would put in the 4 for r and you would rearrange for dr dt. And, and you know, without getting into a, a more complicated example, we know everybody that at this stage where you're ready to use your differentiated equation, you might have a bit of running around to do to find some other numbers. There, there's really a lot of work that can go into that. So I, I'm probably going to amend this later because it's Monday morning and I've been away for longer than most of you have. So uh, I may change this later, but I'm just going to give you some specific examples of what I would say is for sure things that would be related rates that are on exams. Um, the perpendicular motion of ships, uh, clearly it can be planes, it can be anything where the objects are moving perpendicular to each other, and you had an assignment related to that. Um, so the, the things that are changing with respect to time are distances. Spheres, cones, boxes, basically any geometric figure. Triangles, I don't have triangles on there. These could be two-dimensional, they could be three-dimensional. So, I think a really, and we're clearly not going to get through all of this review today, I in this period, in this seminar. I think a really good illustration of that, when I say geometric figures, might be something as simple in shape as a triangle. So I tell you that you have a triangle and the rate of change of the area of the triangle is, boy, I'm really on a four kick this morning, four square centimeters per second. And I also tell you that the height is changing at a rate of negative two centimeters per second what is the rate of change of the base of the triangle when the area equals 20 square centimeters and the height equals 6 centimeters? And that may seem like an awfully complicated question, but it's really simple as long as you understand what it is you need to do. Your formula is A equals one-half the base times the height. Since you have a dA dt and a dH dt and you want to find a dB dt, you don't have to get rid of anything. So you would differentiate this, and I am going to actually differentiate this. You're going to have dA dt equals, I'm going to use the product rule here equals one-half db dt times h plus one-half b times dh dt and then well then you solve the problem you put in your rates of change that you know you put in the base and well you put in the height of six you're going to need to know the base as well, but you do have a formula, and this is where the running around starts to happen. The area is 20. Don't forget, these numbers, you cannot put them in until after you differentiate. You know the area is 20, and it's one-half the base times the height, so that will allow you to find out 
the base, and then you can put everything in and solve the problem. The purpose of this example or these examples I'm giving you is not, well, let's do them. It's to kind of get your memory percolating and remembering what, what it was we did do. I'm going to finish off with one other geometry problem, and then we're going to continue this this afternoon as well as look at your exams this afternoon. You know, the classic example of grain being poured into a conical pile where maybe you're told that the height is always eight times the radius of the cone. That'd be a pretty weird granular structure that it can maintain that ratio, but it's a math class. We're not actually on a farm or in a granary. And you're told that the grain is being dumped onto the pile at 12 cubic meters per minute. That's an awful lot, but that's OK. Find the rate of change of the height when the height is 10. And I have about two minutes before the bell, and I will set it up, and then we will end here. So you go to your formula sheet, and you find the formula for the volume of a cone, which is this. And since we want to find dH dt, you have to get rid of r before you differentiate. But that's pretty easy, because r is h over 8. So all you would do is put volume equals one-third pi times h over 8 squared times h. And now you have a formula with only volume and h in it. You can differentiate. But of course, the wise move is to simplify that first. Uh, h squared times h will give you an h cubed. We also have pi over 3. And we also have over 8 squared, which is 64. So 3 times 64, I think, and maybe somebody can just help me out on a Monday morning, is 192. Pretty sure that's right. So now you would differentiate dv dt equals 3 pi over 192 which is pi over 64, h squared dh dt. Bob's your uncle. Solve the problem. Put in dv dt, put in h, solve for dh dt. We will see you this afternoon where we will continue this review. And uh, the bulk of our time in the next couple of days will be spent working on math. Have a great morning. If there's something that you missed this morning, you can watch about the first 25 minutes of the video. And if there's something from this afternoon that maybe somebody from Buck isn't here to watch, they can watch it. Or maybe you just want to watch it again. We were in the middle of related rates. I had talked about the fact that related rates problems, which you need to know for your exam, and your exam is on um, Thursday. And Zach, you really should have a piece of paper out. And same here with everybody. You're, you should have your notebooks open uh, to write these notes down. Um, I was in the middle of explaining related rates, and I had and I had said that uh, related rates problems in terms of your exam, uh, which is on Thursday, are problems involving two objects which are moving perpendicular to each other, like the sailing ships. Um, any geometry problems where you have spheres or cones or boxes or rectangles or triangles which are growing or shrinking uh, are fair game. And again, I encourage you to watch the video if you, didn't see, if you weren't here this morning because I go through some specific examples. The other two that I can think of that definitely you would want to know for your exam on Thursday are, first of all, the dreaded shadow problem. 
shadow shrinking or growing. That's where you have some object, could be a person, could be an animal, moving towards a lamp that's suspended above the ground in the form of a lamp post or moving away from it. And you have to determine the rate at which the shadow is changing. Or I've, I've never really done this, but I suppose I could give you the rate at which the shadow is changing and ask you how fast the person is walking. There's nothing wrong with setting it up that way. And the other one that is, uh, I consider this next one to be a really simple related rates problem. Very simple, so simple in fact, it should probably take you a minute or two to do, would be the slipping ladder question. And that is where you have a ladder which is, well, slipping. The foot of the ladder is slipping away from a wall and the head of the ladder or the top of the ladder is sliding down the wall and you're told maybe that the foot of the ladder is moving away at one foot per second. The question is how fast is the top of the ladder falling or moving downward at a particular point? The thing to remember about all of these questions with related rates, and I'll use the ladder illustration here to make my point, is if you have a constant, you can put it in right at the beginning. So for example, if I want to go with a slipping ladder problem where this is the floor and this is the wall and this is the ladder and it is an eight foot ladder and the base of the ladder is moving away from the wall at two feet per second and I want to know how quickly the top of the ladder is moving down when x equals 5 feet, I probably wouldn't type up an exam question like that. I'm just abbreviating things. Okay, It would be in words. Then you can use the Pythagorean theorem. I don't think you need to be told that whoever designed and built the house or the building built the wall perpendicular to the floor. You would assume that's true, and I think that's a fair assumption. So you could put x squared plus y squared equals hypotenuse squared, but my point is, since the ladder is 8 feet long, I can put 8 feet in right at the beginning. The ladder isn't shrinking. And I, I know I've talked about this when we learned about related rates. I could, just to make things interesting, and one of these times I think I will, tell you that it's a extendable ladder. And as it's slipping, the length of the ladder is decreasing at one foot per second. And, and although that's maybe not, well, let me pause. So this is how you would set up this problem. You're allowed to put in eight. Although it's not realistic, it's, it's very, we call it contrived. It's not realistic to say that the ladder is shrinking. It's an interesting math problem that you would see in a calculus class. So if I did tell you that dl dt was negative one foot per second, you would not be allowed to say x squared plus y squared equals eight squared. You would have to do that. And then of course, I mean, we're so close to being done this question, but you, you're going to need some other information, which I'll get to in a second. But when you differentiate this, you get 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt equals 2l dl dt. You would need to be told when x is 5 meters and the length of the ladder is six feet. You would have to be told that information. Or there would have to be a way for you to find out how long the ladder is. Otherwise, when you look at this equation right here, when you look at that equation, there would be no way for you to finish the problem because you don't know what L is. Anyway, that's really, when it boils down to it, chapter three. Basic rates of change where you take a formula and you find a derivative and evaluate that derivative. 
um, rates of change involving what physics students would call kinematics. And I don't know, Zach, can you give me a thumbs up? Did you take physics 20 and physics 30? You did, okay. So you understand what I mean when I say kinematics. And I don't know, there might be somebody in this room who has not taken physics 20 or physics 30, I don't know. But um, kinematics just means position, velocity, and acceleration, among other things. And then related rates is a big thing. Uh, let's move on to chapter four. So chapter four. It's really interesting because if you were to go back and look at chapter four, well, allow me to show this to you to make my point. If you were to go back and look at chapter four, Chapter 4 starts with increasing and decreasing functions. And, and we did that in Chapter 5 as well. That has to do with the first derivative chart. But Chapter 4 culminates in doing applied max-min problems. Section 4.1 that you're looking at up here and Section 4.3 are basically telling you that if you find the derivative of a function and identify the critical values of x for the derivative and then do a first derivative table, you can, by looking at that table, determine where the function is increasing and where it's decreasing and therefore determine where the function has a maximum point or a minimum point and or a minimum point. But you'll notice I just leapfrogged over 4.2 because there's something I need to talk specifically about with that. So 4.1 and 4.3 are just using derivatives to find max mins. And although we talked about that extensively in chapter 5 in terms of graphing, that is really something we did in chapter 4 to begin with. So the, the main thrust of the first couple of lessons, forgetting about the middle one, is finding extrema and intervals of increase and decrease from a derivative chart. That's 4.1 and 4.3. 4.1 is finding out where the function is going up, where the function is going down. 4.3 is using that to determine max and min values. Now, I'm going to talk about 4.2. I don't think there's really anything I need to say about that first bullet that I've got written on the board. That was one of the questions on the quiz, and I think for the most part, with the exception of one or two individuals who maybe misunderstood the question, you get it. That was a pretty easy question on the quiz, though, uh, both the first derivative chart one and the second derivative chart one, because they were polynomials. And, and I really just wanted to test your ability to work with those charts. But the 4.2 is something different. You need to remember that we studied finding absolute max or absolute min on a closed interval. And this is where things get tricky. Yeah, tricky is the right word here because there are always going to be areas in calculus that students struggle with because of the math content. This is just something that if I put a question like this on an exam, students struggle with it because it's a trick question. They, they think they need to do something that they don't need to do. And when they do that thing that they don't need to do, they'll get the wrong answer very often. So as an illustration, and I'm going to just go to a specific example here. If I told you that y is equal to x cubed minus x squared minus 6x, and it's defined from
negative 4 to 5. So that's the definition of the domain. And I don't say to you find the maximum or the minimum value of that function. I say find the maximum or minimum value of that function in that domain. So what is y max and what is y min? That's what the question is asking you for. What is the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum? So what people will do is they will say, well, I'm going to find the derivative. And I guess you kind of do need to find the derivative here. Let's see, 3x squared minus 2x minus 6. Um, is that factorable? Let's do our b squared minus 4ac test. I don't think it's going to be. I think it's going to be 76. But I, I'd, I would like to know the number. It is 76? OK. So this is not factorable, which means there's nothing you can really do with it. But we still do need critical values of x. There's nothing you can do with it in terms of factoring. We still need to imagine. We still need to imagine that this is equal to 0 so that we can find the critical values of x. And you would use the quadratic formula here. The critical values of x would be negative b, which would be 2, plus or minus root. I don't know how I can forget a number in 30 seconds. Did I say 76? OK. Plus or minus root 76 all over 2a, which would be 6. And by the way, this would probably be a numerical response question or a multiple choice question. So what that means is we have a critical value of x of 2 plus root 76 all over 6. We have a critical value of x of 2 minus root 72 all over 6. I'm a root 76. I'm aware that root 76 is a radical which can be simplified. And you could simplify those expressions. But that's not important here. Here's where somebody will go off track to get the wrong answer. We don't want to do a first derivative chart here. You don't want to say negative infinity to 2 minus root 76 all over 6, 2 minus root 76 all over 6, to 2 plus root 76 all over 6, and then 2 plus root 76 all over 6 to infinity. You don't want to do that because the function is only defined from negative 4 to 5. And the fact of the matter is, then, negative 4 is also a critical value of x, because that's where the function starts. Now just imagine, and I don't know what this is going to look like, but imagine that where it starts, it's going up from that point. And maybe it never goes back down to that level. That would mean where it starts is actually a minimum, even though that minimum would not be revealed by looking at the derivative chart with those numbers. We also know that there's a critical value of x of 5. So how is it you determine, and I want to stop and back up because I almost missed something here that I think is important. If a function starts at negative 4, and it finishes at 5, and it's continuous, which it is because it's polynomial. I don't care how you draw it. There's got to be a maximum. There's got to be a minimum. If, if y is this here and y is this here, no matter what the function does in between, there's going to be a maximum point and there's going to be a minimum point. They may be those or, or it may be one of these other ones. I'm not claiming that's what it looks like. Okay. So how is it you determine the maximum or the minimum? The answer is you calculate the y-coordinate for each of those x-coordinates, and that's what you have to do. And I would say, in this particular case, it would be easiest to put this function into your graphing calculator. I mean, I suppose we could have done the whole thing graphically, but 
y equals x cubed minus x squared minus 6x. Set up my table to allow me to input x coordinates. Go to my table and start plugging in those critical values of x. Uh, one was, this could be a little tricky because we need to have a set of brackets for the radical critical values of x. Bracket 2 plus root 76, end bracket, end bracket on the entire numerator divided by 6. There's the y coordinate. Then we're going to go to minus the square root of root 76, close brackets on the argument of the radical, close brackets on the entire numerator, divided by 6. And then we had negative 4 and 5. So I, I did. I, I thought I chose numbers that were out there enough that those would be the max mins. So the maximum value of the function is 70, which would never be revealed by a first derivative chart, not unless you recognize that it started at negative 4 and ended at positive 5. Now, I, I realize that that was probably a 10-minute explanation, but you know on these exams, you only have 10 or 12, maybe 14 questions in the first part, and they're worth two marks each. So if this is a multiple choice or a numerical response question, you start getting that one wrong and another one wrong, your mark really starts to bottom out. So watch out for that. Then, of course, going back to a list of everything, Part of me so wants to rewrite that top line. That angle's really gnawing at me. The big part here, of course, is max-min problems, applied max-min problems. Or applied extrema problems. You know, I'll write down some specific examples in a second, but... Um, what should you charge for a ticket price to the concert in order to maximize the revenue? How big, what should the radius of the can be or the barrel of crude oil? What should the radius of that barrel be to minimize the cost? How should the rectangular area be sectioned off to maximize the area with a given amount of rope? How should we construct the box to maximize the volume, which is different than how should we construct the box to minimize the material? Those are two different questions, and I want to go over them with you in a second here. By the way, when we get to the end of my Chapter 4 review, there's not much I'm going to say about Chapter 5 because we just finished it. I'm going to hand back your quiz, and you can use the rest of today's class to go over the corrections to your quiz and get started on review. So lots of different situations here. I would say definitely one would be maximizing revenue. And be aware here that it doesn't have to be revenue. I, I, an example would be, I'm going to retire in a few years, I think. I'm going to go down south. I'm going to buy myself a kumquat uh, orchard, I guess would be the word. And I'm going to plant kumquat trees. I don't know what a kumquat is. It's some kind of fruit. But I, the, the people I'm buying it from have a certain number of trees there, and they get a certain number of kumquats per tree per acre. And I'm told that if you plant one more tree, you get two fewer kumquats per acre. How many trees should I plant? I hope you recognize that that's a revenue problem. It's as, as I increase one thing, the other thing goes down. The thing to remember about these revenue problems is, I don't want to say all the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to be a quadratic function. So differentiating it will give you linear, which gives you only one critical value of x. Um, maximizing. any kind of rectangular area.
And by the way, I would never give you a problem in this course that says, what are the dimensions of the rectangle that would maximize the area for a given perimeter? Because it's always going to be a square. But I would give you problems where you have a rectangle which is going to be sectioned off into different corridors. Or I would give you one where you have a rectangle, but one of the sides of the rectangle is not going to be built because we're going to use a river or a building for that side. And I would give you ones where you have a combination of those, where you're going to use the river as one side, and then you want four partitions in between. Minimizing cost. Now, you have done one problem on an assignment and at least one or two from the textbook and the examples where you're minimizing a cost. The one from your assignment had that, it was a crude barrel, right? That's the one I gave you guys this year. Um, but it doesn't have to be a barrel. I could, I could tell you that we're going to make a box and the lid and the base of the box cost a different amount per square foot or square inch than the sides. Okay. Um, another one that is a very common occurrence is maximizing volume, right? And there, I mean, there's just so many different examples, and I would never ask them all of you on an exam, but the one with maximizing volume that we started with, just to trigger your memory, is where we cut out corners of a sheet of cardboard and folded up the sides. Now, I consider that a very, what do I call it, an entry-level max-min problem. But we also had ones where you were going to build a box that had a square base and an open top, and you had a certain amount of material to use, and you wanted to maximize the volume. Um, Are there other situations? Definitely, but I think that pretty much covers it. And I want to, and I know I did this with you before, but to finish off my review of Max Min in Chapter 4, I want to talk about two problems which can easily be confused. One is, these are both going to be situations where we have a square base, open top, box. We are going to construct a box somehow that has a square base and an open top. And there's something I haven't talked about in going through all of these examples of applied max min. And that's going to come out in my illustration. So in question one, we want to maximize the volume. And in question two, which is a different question, we want to minimize the cost. And they're two different questions, but I'm going to be working on them kind of side by side. And in question two, we have a volume of 12,000 cubic inches. By the way, do not try to compare the box that's going to come about out of question two with the box that's going to come out about in question one. They're different. And here we have a total amount of material to work with of 1,400 square centimeters. So again, I'm using a different set of units here just to reinforce that these are two totally different situations. And, and the big thing that I want to point out to you here is that in question one, in question one, the variable is volume. Whereas in question two, the variable to be optimized is cost. Whereas in question one, and in question two, 
These two things have a specific name, and I haven't used the name today. Does anybody remember what we call these? Farhan? What do we call the things I've highlighted in green? Constraints. Yeah, they're constraints. Now, they're not really equations of constraints, but they will be in a second. And I'm not going to draw a box, but if you have a square-based box with an open top, the volume will be the base times the width times the height. And I'm going to say, I guess I'd better draw it. I'm going to say that what we have is a box that looks like this. Are you with me on that? Does that kind of look OK? All right. So what we have is a box that is x by x by h, which means that in question 2, x squared h equals 12,000. Because that's how you find the volume, length times width times height. In question one, we have to add together all, be careful here, all five sides of that box. There's not six because it's an open top, although I could make it a closed top and change the question. Uh, the area of, say, the right-hand side would be xh. And since it's square and the box has the same height everywhere, that's the area of the right-hand side and the front and the back. And, you know, I don't know. If you're in post-secondary and you write A equals 4XH, your prof or your TA, whoever's marking your work, might say, well, you, why are you getting that? You might need to explain it. And that's something you're going to have to test the waters with in, in your post-secondary courses. You know, some of your profs will go, no, I don't, I don't want you to explain that. And they might even take off marks for you wasting your time by you explaining it the first time. I've heard stories. Uh, we also have the bottom of the box, which is x squared. So we can write, I should have written 1,400 equals 4xh plus x squared. I'm not going to finish these problems. I, I, I think you should. I think you should know how to do these problems. Um, but we also have volume equals x squared h here, and we have area equals 4xh plus x squared here. <laughs> so we use both formulas in either of the questions. It's just that in one of the questions for the area, we actually have a value for it. And what we're trying to do, everybody, in the question on the left is you're trying to be able to come up with dv d something so that you can find the critical value so you can determine the max or the min. And the problem is that you have too many variables. So if you were after dv dx, h needs to go. And that's where you use the equation of constraint. This is now the equation of constraint. This is the equation of constraint. So you would rearrange that equation for h, put it in, simplify it as much as you can before you differentiate, then differentiate, find the critical value of x. And although I believe we did the wire question, didn't we? Where you cut the wire out and you have to maximize the area of the circle and the square and minimize the area of the circle and square. Although we did one of those problems that had two possible answers, this expression on any exam question in my Math 31 classes, that expression will always only have one critical value of the independent variable that fits with the question. There might be eight critical values, but seven of them are negative and one is positive. 
right? And, the, and X can't be negative. Over here, your goal is to find d80 something. Again, I would recommend d80 X so that you could find the critical value of X to answer the question. What you're going to need to do here is this needs to go. So you're going to take a look at the equation immediately above that, rearrange that for H, put it in, and off you go. I could, I could with, so I'm going to pause there. Any questions with question one or two? I could make things interesting with question two by saying the bottom of the box costs three times as much as the top of the box. And if the bottom costs three times as much, then you would have to wedge a three in here for the area of the bottom. This is not truly area anymore. It's a, it's a relative cost of the sides. But I don't know if you remember when we did this with the, the building on the shore of Lake Fred and brick and glass walls. It's complicated to do it properly. This is good enough. This is still properly enough that you're going to get the right answer. It's just not area, but that's OK. And it's not cost either, because you don't know how much it is per square, per meter or inch or whatever it is. So that's basically it for chapter four. I have a feeling there's a max min problem that I'm maybe missing in my head. But if it occurs to me and I feel that you should maybe be told it, then I will do that. Um, you know, chapter five is all about graphing. So uh, very quickly here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Symmetry. I know that when we graphed functions, we also had to look at x and y intercepts, but that is not a calculus skill. I'm not going to waste your exam time by asking you for x and y intercepts. But symmetry is something you need to be aware of. Uh, vertical asymptotes. And that includes, and this, the limits, the, the second set of questions on your exam really threw some of you, where you had to find limits as x approaches some non-permissible value of x from the left of the function, and limits as x approaches some non-permissible value of x from the right of the function. This is the idea that if you have a vertical asymptote, as you approach it from the left or the right, these have to be equal to infinity or negative infinity. So these will be equal to negative infinity or infinity. So it has nothing to do with continuity or anything that we learned about in the first unit. Uh, on the other hand, horizontal asymptotes And by the way, with vertical asymptotes, with these, I do understand what some of you did. And, and it's legit. It's OK at this level. You just put in if A was 2 and you were approaching it from the left, you put in 1.99999. You got a positive number, so you said it was positive infinity, because you know it has to be infinite. Horizontal asymptotes, what you're dealing with there, what you're dealing with here is the limit as x approaches infinity of a function. And there's a very specific way to do this. By the way, this was question three on the quiz. This was question two. I've got them in the opposite order here, I think. Um, there's an algebraic way to do that. And it's expected at this level that you do it algebraically. And it's where you divide every term in the numerator and denominator of the expression by x raised to the highest degree. Okay. Um, what else? Really, I mean, if you look at what I'm doing here, I'm going through chapter five in terms of your quiz. 
that you'll get back shortly. Chapter one is all about, or section, question one is all about symmetry. Question two, I believe I asked you about horizontal asymptotes. Three was vertical. Um, I believe question four was about increasing, decreasing in terms of y, which that's chapter four too, right? That's the beginning of chapter four. There's, there's an overlap there. They, these two layers come across on top of each other. Um, also known as the first derivative chart. The only thing I didn't ask you here that I would on a unit exam is I wouldn't get you to just do the first derivative chart. I would get you to determine if there was a max or a min and where it occurred. Are, are you with me on that? That on the quiz, I just said, where is it increasing and where is it decreasing? But I didn't say, what are the max mins? Um, another very important idea is concavity. Concave up versus concave down. And what I'm talking about here is a second derivative chart. And I did not specifically address this, but with the second derivative chart, which is used to find where's, where the function is concave up and concave down, this leads to inflection points. Just like this leads to extrema, meaning max min points. The very last thing we did in this chapter was put it all together and graph things. And I've already told you that that process is just too, um, there's too much there for an exam. You know, that's a, that's a 45 minute question. But question six on your quiz, gives you a good flavor of, of how, of what I want you to be able to do in terms of graphing. I want you to be able to tell me about the first and second derivative by looking at a graph. Or looking at the first and second derivative, tell me about the graph. And uh, you're going to get lots of time here to look at your quiz, but I want to bring up that quiz right now and discuss that final question with you. Give me one second. Just so you know, when you get back your quiz, you will see in the top right corner of this one of two things written. You might see in the top right corner this. And that's for the people who, based on the answer to the first part of this question, where is the first derivative positive? If you wrote, I think I can fit it in here, among other things that the first derivative, I'll just go a little smaller. If you wrote that the first derivative is positive from negative infinity to A, from A to C, and then you wrote other stuff, pardon me, and you wrote from A to B and from B to C, 
then you are telling me, based on what you wrote there, that you believe the derivative is not positive at b. Because you're not including b. And that means you're interpreting this to be a horizontal tangent. And that's fine. Okay? But then you have to, where you talk about the derivative being 0, put at b. What some people did is you said from a to c, the derivative is positive, And then when it was, where is it 0, you put b. You can't have both. You can't have the first derivative being positive at b and the first derivative being 0 at b. So this is very interesting to try to mark this. There's all kinds of avenues you can go down. Um, anyway, I would not give you this question on an exam. This was the written response graphing question last year. I would probably maybe give you Here's a good one. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Here's a first derivative. Here's a, here's a first derivative chart completed for you. Here's a second derivative chart completed for you. Here's a couple of other things about the function. Sketch the function. I, I can't give you the function and say sketch it because you're just going to go to your calculator. That's not the point of this course. But the challenge then becomes and I will finish this off by finally saying, remember where we had, and we were graphing, we had something that we used as a tool where we had the following. And you had to put it together. That's what I'm talking about. The only thing is you don't have any y coordinates, so you can do whatever you want. You know, you might realize that for this section over here, it's going to look like that. It has to look like that, doesn't it? Um, well, it has to look like that. And I would be looking on the exam is the maximum occurring right there. And then it's decreasing. Now, wait a minute. What has to happen here? It's a cusp. I mean, that's maybe too easy. Challenging as it is, it's maybe too easy. I might throw in, well, by the way, there's a vertical asymptote at this point, and and there's a hole at this other point, and you have to try to put it together. What I will tell you right now is, so we're done with the official review. On your exam, you are going to have three written response. You will have a related rates You will have an optimization. And you will have a graphing. You will have a chapter 3, a chapter 4, and a chapter 5. And for each of the application problems, you will have two options. And you, you know by now in this course, you're not going to have enough time to sit there and have a philosophical discussion in your brain about which of the two options you should pursue. You're going to have to look at them and go, I'm going to do this one. You just don't have time. So I might give you for the optimization some kind of a revenue problem, although I think that's maybe too easy for a written response. I might give you a cost problem with a box or a cylinder and a, uh, some kind of complicated area problem. For the related rates, I might give you perpendicular motion of ships and, I don't know, a cone that's being drained of water or something like that. Yeah? No. The question being asked is, we, and we have run into one where if you go to positive infinity and negative infinity, you get different 
results. The question being asked is, when we find horizontal asymptotes, we take the limit as x approaches infinity, and Ben's asking, well, we have to do as x approaches negative infinity, and I'm saying no. Hmm, good question. I don't, I, I, you know what I believe, the question now being asked is what about the second derivative test, which is not a concavity thing. The second derivative test, and I want to write this down to show this to you. The second derivative test says, among other things, and then I will answer your question, if the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is negative, that there's a max at that point. Because the only way the first derivative can be zero is if the slope is horizontal. And the only way it can be concave, the only way it can be a second derivative being negative is if it's concave down. In fact, that's what I have right here at this point. So, no, I will not ask you anything specific about the second derivative test, but you should understand the behavior of the second derivative or what the second derivative is at max and at mins. In other words, the second derivative test is kind of contained in here. The only way you can draw it is like that because it's concave down and it's, I'm assuming the derivative is zero here. So before I hand back your quiz, um, I, I hope that helped. There's a lot of material we covered, but so much of the time in this course, we, we cover all this material at the beginning just to be absorbed later on in another topic. So there's a lot of lessons you'll go back and you'll go, how many times have we done this? But I hope it helped. Any other questions before I hand back your quiz? Yeah, of course, yeah. All right, so I'm going to hand back the quiz. Um, Zach, I, did I email your quiz to you? You did, so you have it. Okay. And I just confirmed, Zach, that Demi and Nicole are both absent today. Is that right? Thank you.